record. Hi, good evening. This is Wendy Murdoch, and I'm here with Violet Van Van Hees. Is that right? You got it. Violet, and we're going to talk about vagus nerve and surefoot. Um, just a little bit about Violet. I'm going to read from her bio here. She is a tone to touch equine practitioner and a Feldenkrais practitioner, which of course is uh, to my heart. And you live in Deep Bay, Vancouver Island, and you've completed Kathy Kane's Touch Skills Trauma for Trauma Therapist. So I would assume that has a lot to do with Vegas Nerve. Um, and you uh, have a mayor named Shiraz. Shiraz. Yes, like the wine. Oh, okay. Yep. <laughs> and a cat named Max. And of course, Absolutely. Um, you love animals, and that's why we're here. So um, I met. Violet at the team celebration in February in Santa Fe, and I uh, just was uh, thrilled listening to your talk. I thought it was amazing. So I wanted to be able to share that, some of that information with our Surefoot fans. So um, do I have this on record? Yes, it's recording. Yes. Okay, great. So I'm just going to turn it right over to you because I don't want to waste any time. Okay, I'm just going to switch to share screen here. and We'll get my PowerPoint. I hope. Can you, can yes. you see this? Got it. And if anybody has any trouble, if they just uh, make a comment, that's probably the best way to keep track of. Uh, okay, and can you see it? So is the webinar on the screen now? Yes. Okay. So I'm just gonna present today, Wendy and I have lots to talk about. So we're gonna see how far we get. Um, but I wanted to start with some technical information. So the sciencey background to stuff, because we see all this stuff that happens with Surefoot. And there's a lot of stuff that's affecting the internal experience of the horses. And for ourselves, when we stand on them as well. And um, there's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on with the nervous system, where we can see on the outside some indicators of the state on the inside. And the state might be one of the calm, happy, feeling good states, or it might be fight or flight, or it might be freeze, or it might be something like that. And the better we get at kind of reading the, the, uh, what we're seeing and what we're noticing in the horse, the more we can find out which state are they in and can we help bring them into the state where learning is easier, where life feels better, where their health tends to be better, those kinds of things. So then we become sort of detectives in that process. So I wanted today to present some of the science behind this and then we can start to talk uh, in the time that we have this time or else next time yeah. more into what do we see and what does it mean. So does that, that sound good? Great, yep. And Great. I love the fact that we're already planning on doing more of these because I this is a really deep subject. I think we could go pretty far. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's fascinating because it really, it, we're mammals, horses are mammals. There's a lot of stuff that goes on that makes it, when we see it in animals, it starts to make sense in people, right? Actually, animals are easier to, to work with and see it in. People are a little better at hiding stuff, but it starts to go, oh, I get it. Yep. That makes so much sense. So let's go with it. So we're gonna talk today or look today a bit at the difference in the biology and the physiology, what's going on inside our cells, um, between the protective states when danger, when we experience danger, which is either fight, flight, or freeze, and the state in which we feel safe and the world is good. Um, somebody's rattling something. Are you able yeah, to mute people? Uh, I'll just make sure everybody's muted. There, okay. Yeah, I think you can mute everybody except us if you yeah. want to. Beauty, then everybody can do what they like. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, and then as I said, we can um, see what, what can we know about when we notice things on the outside, what can that tell us about what's going on inside for the, for the horse or for ourselves or for whoever we're looking at. So just a little bit about me to introduce myself. You did some, I'll offer a bit more. I have a big black horse, you can see her there, she does. Um, she loves to run. Um, and that was my, one of my bucket list moments of letting her run with just the neck rein on, right? And do bareback. I wanted to do that once. So I've done it once. Don't have to do it again, but it was great. Yeah. Um, I have been doing Tellington Touch stuff with horses since 2006. Um, I have taken the trauma um, skills training with Kathy Kane. So I have a background in what is happening in the physiology um, and in our, in our body, and when, when we have experienced trauma and it's sort of sitting in, inside somewhere, how does it show up? Um, I was a long time fitness leader, um, which gave me a background in anatomy and physiology and how things, you know, how we move, how things work. 
um, a long time in government doing policy and intergovernmental work and um, a lot of interest just in how things, I love sciencey stuff and making science practical. So that's what I love to do now is bring this information, make it useful, make it something we can relate to and go, oh, okay. That's yeah. awesome. It's good. We can use it. Yeah. So um, a little bit about the nervous system and especially the autonomic nervous system, the vagus nerve. What happens in Vegas does not stay in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> the vagus nerve is part of our parasympathetic nervous system. We're going to talk about it a bit. But it's the parasympathetic nervous system is part of what's called the autonomic nervous system. That's the stuff that runs in the background. Um, we have the voluntary nervous system, which is when I reach out to get you know, a glass of water or the cheesies from the counter because I want to eat them or whatever. Um, and then there's the stuff that runs in the background that keeps us ticking, keeps us alive, keeps us going without us having to pay attention to it. And there's two big divisions of that. One is the sympathetic nervous system. And that's the one that fires us up and gets us ready for action, supports action, gets the blood to the muscles, helps us do stuff. And then there's the parasympathetic nervous system and its job is to slow things down. And the sympathetic nervous system supports in part the fight or flight danger response and it also supports all the good stuff that we like to do you know like the good stuff where we get revved up to do things and the parasympathetic nervous system helps us calm but it may also take us into a state that's a danger protection state of shutdown so there's there's and we didn't know really that we haven't been taught a lot about the two different aspects of the parasympathetic nervous system until um, Stephen Porges came along. So, as I said, the, the sympathetic helps us do stuff. So run or, you know, run for fun or run away from danger or those kinds of things that sort of moves us up. And the parasympathetic helps us sleep, um, conserve energy, and also do things like faint or, you know, if bad danger is coming, uh, do things where we really shut down. Okay. So let me just ask a quick question here because I think I've been yeah. confusing things. I, I somehow thought that sympathetic was fight, flight, freeze, faint, and fool around. But what you're saying is sympathetic is fight, flight, and then freeze. Faint. Well, it's, yeah, it's fight, flight, and fool around. Okay, so it's only yeah. three. And then the freeze and faint and okay are all part of parasympathetic. Well, yeah, yeah. And well, and the okay part is actually a mix. It's just that you feel safe. I'll get into this in a second. There's the all is well state where you feel, where you feel good. And you can have a range of up and down, and you, but you feel safe. And then there's danger response systems that happen when the, when, the, when the body senses that there's danger and it's no longer fun and it's no longer safe, it goes into a danger response. Okay. And that's when our physiology really changes into something else. And that's when learning changes. That's when health gets undermined if you stay there too long, all sorts of things. And that's, that's what we'll look at in the next couple of slides here. So what are those things? Okay. Yeah. But the doing stuff part, when you're actually doing stuff, is usually activated by sympathetic or supported by the sympathetic nervous system because it revs up your muscles, it revs up your respiration, it revs up everything to support action. Yeah. So, in the, so Stephen Porges, Dr. Stephen Porges in the 1990s came up with a theory to explain some stuff that he was finding when he was researching the parasympathetic nervous system. And he was finding that there are two really distinct branches where the body can slow down and they're very different. And I've sort of characterized it as, um, you know, it's like there's a bridge between two countries. So this is a bridge in Golden Gate Park. And if you walk up the bridge or you go up the bridge, this is where there's action, right? The sympathetic nervous system, you do stuff. And then when you calm down from that or, you, or your body slows, there's two options that the body can go into. One is this landing in this place where all is well. And this is what we, always, what we used to talk about parasympathetic as, you know, rest, digest, all is cool, all is good, regenerate, all those good things. But um, he was also noticing that, you know, for example, in preterm babies, um, some babies um, were fine and they could calm down. But if they, uh, but there was also the thing that could kill them, where if their heart rate went too low, they would die. And so he was trying to figure out: is it just like a sliding scale where you get some and it's good, and you keep going that down that slide, and there's more, and then it's fatal, or are there two things? And he's found that there's actually two different. Uh, branches or, or structures, whole networks in the parasympathetic nervous system in mammals. 
So this is something that developed in mammals um, to have the two distinctions, one that's all is well and one that's a danger response where we shut down quite severely or we can shut down quite severely in response to danger. So I'll look at each of these and what they are there. So on the one side, we've got all is well. So when you come down from this fight or flight um, and you come down into this place, you land in a place where the thinking brain can take over. You can kind of notice and, and um, what's happening around you. There's social engagement. So we're able to talk to others. We're able to notice other people, respond to them. There's a sense of safety over on this side. You feel safe. And you get the feeling of feeling safe from those around you. Um, this is a newer branch of the, of the parasympathetic nervous system. This developed in mammals. It doesn't exist in reptiles, doesn't exist in fish, um, doesn't exist in earlier types of animals, but it did develop in mammals. And it's in part because we need time to develop when we are born. We need support. We need, uh, we can't live on our own. We have to have those around us help take care of us, and we need social engagement to make that work. So there's this whole system set up to have social engagement and to allow this to come on track. So this particular branch of the parasympathetic nervous system is also a learned response. So the, the nerve is there, but we have to learn how to use it. And we learn how to use it through experience and through those around us. So it's, it's and this is um, the part that's, that's regulated by the ventral vagus nerve, which is the one that sort of goes into our chest and sits right next to all the nerves that feed into the face, the facial expressions, um, taste, smell, all those functions that we're going to be looking at with the horses and so on. Um, all those things are indicators of what's happening with the ventral vagus nerve and is this working in, and it's the doorway in to helping work with the vagus nerve as well. If we can get social engagement going, we, we can help activate the capacity of the vagus nerve. And it can do good things like decide after, you know, after a shock has happened, it's like, do I run, do I, what do I do? It can come in and go, wait a minute, let's look and think about this. So it's the thinking brain part. We can make little models of the world, we can assess the situation, have a second look at it, and decide, hmm, you know, this is, you know, maybe it's not so bad. So in Tellington Touch, we often talk about wanting to get the horses into a thinking state you know, help them move into the place where they, where they can think about what's going on and, rather than just react. So we're wanting to help them move into this place so that that thinking capacity can step in and help them look at the situation and go, okay, I'm actually all right. I don't need to, um, you know, do the behavior. You know, I don't need to respond to the world. It's not a threat. I'm actually okay. I'm actually safe here. So then you get that, that comes on board when, when this, um, when this branch of the nervous system gets to be more active, more available to us. And we can learn how to uh, tap into that sooner and quicker over time. That response capacity, the, the time it takes to come into this response can become less as we become good at using it. And this is the zone when the, that, that branch of the parasympathetic nervous system is in action. Um, it's also paired up with a, a healthy response in the sympathetic nervous system. And we get this zone or this range um, in a healthy regulated nervous system here where there's a normal range that's called the, the window of tolerance, where we can have a certain amount of up and excitement and then coming back down. Um, but it all feels safe. It's the zone in which we feel safe. So it's our capacity to be engaged in the world, to have exciting things like doing webinars or learning something new or, or being in a play fight or those kinds of things. But it's experienced as something safe. And you can be immobilized as well. You can sleep. Um, you can have intimate uh, encounters. You can um, have situations in which, you know, for humans laying on a class, on the floor for a class, you know, those kinds of things can, if they feel safe, then you're in this zone. But there's this thing that happens sometimes and, and sort of within that window of tolerance, that's where we can explore and learn and, and basically live life with the least amount of energy expenditure. So it's, a, it's the low cost of doing business for life. And it's where animals have to spend a lot of their time if they're going to survive. So this is my horse and a few others. They lived out on the range for a bunch of months of the year. They need to be in that state for most of the time. 
They need to be able to go up and respond to danger. They might go down to respond to, to other stuff, but they need to spend most of their time in that all is well state because it's sort of the energy conservation. It's, you know, it's the best place to be where life goes on and, and things work well. And it's where you can learn best. So I, in the Tellington Touch, we try to make sure that the learning happens in a way where it doesn't cause fear and where each step is just the, the next step. And then the first time on a horse looks something like this, this picture here. Um, and then when things get uh, sort of feeling scary or overwhelming, then you start to go outside of that range. And going a little bit outside of that range and coming back into it is, is sort of a normal part of living. You know, you might get afraid if something scary happens, you spike, you know, I fall off my bike, it's kind of frightening, I, I, and then I can come back in and self-regulate. Or I might go into a bit of a freeze, you know, I, I spook or I, I startle and I can't, take action for a moment and then I can sort of breathe and come back into the normal state. And that's okay, but if I end up staying in a fight flight response for a long time or down in freeze for a long time, that's when we start to get into trouble. But these are protection states. So when things feel dangerous, our body switches out of the states, out of the physiology that supports all as well. And we go into a different kind of stress chemistry in our body. There's other stuff that happens. Different chemistry starts to run. We start to have stress hormones running in our body. We start to um, shut down some of the, 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 the functions that serve the brain and sort of send the, send the blood around in the ways that support us in healthy ways. We end up compromising our immune system. Lots of things can happen if we spend too much time outside of that normal range. And freeze is, so, yeah, do you have a question? Oh, what? I'm just thinking about um, how, like, horses with ulcers are outside that range, and you know, they're stressed all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's an indicator that they're, that they're not able to regenerate and recover. So the, the um, this all is well state, this is the place that supports rest and recovery. So this is the place where, you know, the, as I said, the, the, uh, the cost of doing business in life is, is lowered. Um, your body has time and capacity to regenerate and restore itself and those kinds of things. But if you're in a danger response, your body considers for that to be a biological priority and it will run the, the stress chemistry and keep you revved, keep you in those, those states for as long as it senses danger is there because that matters for survival. Right? So, and then if that's happening, then uh, you get other kinds of things going on. So one of them is that you may end up in the freeze response. So there's an interesting thing about freeze because it can look calm and not be calm. Right. And we often have overlooked this aspect of freeze. We, and freeze can be a whole continuum. Robin uh, Hood coined the term slush, you know? I <laughs> use it all the time. Certain amount of slush in the system. Or it can be, you know, a temporary kind of free state, or it can be um, ongoing functional freeze. There's a lot of people and a lot of animals. We're just getting the lawnmowers coming. I'm moving. It's Thursday. It's lawnmower day. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to go in the hallway here, and hopefully this is going to work. Okay. And the long hallway. Let's try this. Okay. I think we're good. Hopefully. Otherwise, I'm going in the bathroom with the door closed. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll feel safe, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so the, the, uh, what happens if we go into freeze is that now there's the other branch of the parasympathetic nervous system that kicks in. It's the old branch that's shared with other types of animals, with reptiles, snakes, and, you know, birds. I am moving. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Are we good? No, we're good. Okay. Just getting my chair. Okay. <laughs> Close the door. All right, here we go. Um, so this one's an interesting branch of the nervous system. I sound like I'm in an echo chamber now, but sorry. it's okay. <laughs> um, this branch, for most of us, is functioning fully when born. So it's the one that, you know, if there's a shock to our system, it takes over, it takes action. Um, and it's either, you know, we'll, either our sympathetic nervous system tries to take action, or if things are overwhelming, 
your body will numb itself, shut down, collapse in, in response to danger, right? And it, and it can be anywhere from numb to complete, com complete collapse. And the, we might say, well, why isn't this a good response to danger? Well, the problem is that this response is sort of, Kathy Kane calls it slow and sloppy. It doesn't have nuance, right? It sort of gets the job done and it decides something's wrong, I'm just gonna shut it down. Right? So you can get something that's a fairly strong response and it's hard for the body to come out of it sometimes. So this is why like 25% of little birds that, that go into shock after they hit the window don't come out of it. Okay. Um, those kinds of things. Their body just doesn't override it soon enough to get them back out of it. Once we get the other branch, the newer branch of the nervous system online for us, the, the other branch of the vagus nerve there, um, it steps in sooner and helps us get back into the, the uh, you know, back into life sooner again. Um, and that's one of its jobs. But again, we have to learn how to use that branch of the nervous system. So the dorsal vagus no, uh, nerve, when it's in high tone, when it's activated, shuts us down. And for us, when we're working with horses, what we want is to help uh, the horses experience what it feels like to feel the all is well state and um, find more ways to get themselves back there and get themselves back there sooner um, so that they can be at ease, so they can respond to the world, uh, you know, more from their thinking selves, just as we would like to be more from our thinking selves rather than just reacting. And they can spend more time in the state that's, that's uh, open for curiosity and learning and interest in life. It's a place where we can do things best and learn things best. So um, part of what Surefoot does, and what's really interesting in Surefoot, is that we see, see Surefoot bring animals into what seems to be the all is well state more often. Um, and it's, so it's a really effective doorway for getting them there. And once an animal's had that experience, they often will look for it. They're pretty smart about these things. When something feels good and is useful, their whole body is interested in going there more often. Um, so I just want to look a little bit at what is going on or what, what these things look like when we're in the protective states rather than in the all is well state. And then, um, so you can see, you can sort of get a sense of what you're seeing. And then we can look at what are we seeing, what are we noticing when there's a shift happening in a horse when we're working with them. So, one of the key things is that fight, flight, and freeze are physiological responses to danger. They're not behavior choices. So if a horse shuts down, if there's something like, it just looks like the shutters came down over their eyes, or it looks like they are frozen, they can't, they can't step into a trailer, they're just bracing. It may be that they absolutely cannot do it. It's just like us, we're finding in humans. Um, you know, when somebody says, well, why didn't you run? I would have run if somebody was coming after me. And they basically said, my legs couldn't move. My body just couldn't move. And it's true that the physiology, if it's feeling like fight and flight, can't happen or isn't going to take care of the situation, we'll go to the even older response, which is freeze, and that takes over. And uh, it's sort of our biology that decides this, not the little thinking brain that decides this. And the biology is taking care of us in the best way our bodies can figure out how. And it's decided this is a bad enough situation, I'm going for freeze. And the freeze can happen first as well. If it's a learned response or a startle or spook, it's kind of like freeze. It's sort of like, this and then what right so there is there can be a freeze response that happens immediately and it can also become the default response if there's a learned helplessness or if there's a um, sort of a sense of there's nothing I can do then the default can become going into freeze rather than going for fight flight first so again you have to look at the situation the horse is in or what kind of situation that have they been given any like often I think courses that are so tied in into draw reins and all these other things, they're in a state of freeze. They can't think anymore, they can't function, they're just trying to stay alive and get through whatever is going on there. Right? And so there's a real physiological thing going on there rather than a behavioral thing. It looks like behavior, but they're not lazy, they're not stubborn, they're not being these other things. It's not choosing to do those things, it's just the biology has taken an action that makes them 
be in that kind of state and not be able to think differently or act differently at that time. And I think an inter for me, um, Kathy Kane talked about anxiety being sort of foot on the gas and foot on the brake in the, in the, in the defense systems at the same time, right? both things at the same time. So it's like you really want to take action, but you can't. And it's like you're really agitated and you're really keen to take action and you just can't do it. So I think there's a picture, I've got people here in front of the, the horse, the picture of the head of the horse. Mm -hmm. Sort of like start like this, and you might get that kind of look. So, what do they look like? So, fight and flight. So, the bucking bronco, we just had the stampede. So, I was thinking of fight and flight, foot on the gas, right? Mm -hmm. So, here we go. Um, you know, the heart rate and the breathing increases. Um, we're, we're more familiar with fight or flight. We, under, we see it more, we, we notice it. You know, the, and the blood goes into the arms and legs to support running or action. You may get a uh, behavior that's really exuberant or excited or overstimulated. It's usually, it's often adrenaline fueled. Um, and if it's chronic, then in people, you'll notice constant vigilance. It's sort of this always being concerned about what's around, never being able to sort of come down. They're always kind of wired. And in some animals who are in states that, that um, they can't come back into a regulated state that well, they may be like that as well. And it is part of the action and mobilization mode. Um, it's just that uh, once it becomes fight or flight, it's a danger response rather than, you know, a useful, good, feeling safe action response. In the freeze, it's the foot on the brakes. So in the freeze, it's an energy conservation mode. So your heart rate goes down, your blood goes back into the core, you may have numbness or reduced sensations. Uh, you may have adrenal or body exhaustion, um, and it may look calm, but the body is completely swimming in stress chemistry and physiology. So that's where it's very different from being calm. So, and you, you know, in humans, again, you might have some people in yoga class who love laying on the floor and think it's the nicest thing ever, and other people who get completely twitchy when they lay on the floor and are trying to look calm and trying to be compliant and trying to do it, but it doesn't feel good at all to them. And so they are trying to look calm, but on the inside, they are absolutely not calm. And actually, one of the early um, telling to touch research studies that was done, or um, I think it was Robin Bernhardt and, and I forget the other person that was involved, but they were putting electrodes just on a horse and then they were stroking them with a wand. And while they were being stroked with the wand, all the brain waves came into a nice regulated state. And, uh, shifted quite considerably over three minutes of being stroked with the wands. And then what they almost didn't include in the report but did was that just before that started, when they had the electrodes on the horse, and the horse looked completely calm standing in the stall, that the brainwaves that were going on were all the high-level beta anxiety brainwaves. So this horse was very anxious, but looked like they were perfectly calm standing in their, in their stall. So again, it can be deceptive, looks can be deceptive. We kind of have to look for a variety of different indicators of what is happening, what's becoming good detectives, right? And, and really trying to take a look at what's going on there. I don't wanna rush you, but we're getting close on time. I, this is so fascinating and I want you to talk a lot more about this. Um, I think I have like three more slides. Oh, great, okay. So I think we're good. And I think we can go to 40 minutes, but I'm okay. not sure. I'm hoping. Yeah. So both of these, as I said, are a high cost of doing business. The body uses more energy doing these things and can recover less well. Um, so you can also run down your immune system, you can run down health, you can run down digestion. If there's issues with digestion, issues with immune, issues with other things, it's often because the body is running a lot of energy trying to deal with survival on one of these levels. And, and maybe um, if we can look at that and find out, can we help that shift, then we may be able to help the, the health come back in more. So just really briefly, you know, some sur the survival responses are really useful because they keep us alive, but too much um, of anything is, um, is not a good thing. And stress is meant to be a temporary thing. It's meant to sort of spur us into action and then we come back and recover. Um, and so just being careful when we're looking at a horse um, what's going on, how much stress we're placing on them. 
And a really key part for this is that our bodies really are smart. Whatever is going on is going on for a good reason. And our bodies are doing the best they can to take care of us in the best way possible. And the patterns that we're seeing are patterns that were set up because they were useful when they first started. So if the horse is in a stress, you know, is looking, if the animals or if human is stressed or tight or something is going on, that was probably a useful strategy at the time it was first put in place. Um, but now we're fine, you know, and, that, and the problem is that now it's not so well, not so good because it's kind of undermining our ability to move well or do stuff well. So it's trying to find out and appreciate what has been going on because it was useful and can we place, replace it with something even more useful, even more helpful, even feels better. And the way to help something new come in is to, in our bodies, is to experience it. And if it's something that you can experience that's interesting, engaging, and feels safe, then the nervous system becomes interested in learning something new because it's not survival related. It doesn't, it doesn't um, start to undermine your survival as long as it feels safe. So again, doing little tiny steps here, we're helping our new horse get ready for people to be coming onto its back, helping with lots of different experiences of people on one side, people on the other, all those kinds of things. Little steps that feel safe, are interesting, and get to be an experience, an actual experience. And that's it, basically. And the Surefoot is so great because the pads offer a new experience in ways that feel safe and are open for the horse to tell us how much they want and what's enough and what feels good and what doesn't and those kinds of things. And I think that's one reason the Surefoot is so powerful is because it gives that kind of opportunity for the horse to be a part of deciding how much is good and what do I want. And then the kind of learning that opens up that feeling of safety and opens up the doorway to learning becomes available much more quickly. And, and I think that's what we're seeing a lot, and those shifts start to happen because you've got that kind of thing that you're offering them. So there you go. Cool. So, you know, it's so fascinating because I just had a horse this past weekend, a stallion, who, um, you know, the woman didn't tell me the whole story, but he came in and he's an upper level dressage horse, and he was, it, it was obvious he was so stressed. And she, you know, she had a lot of issues too, car wrecks and stuff like that. But it was so fascinating because to work with this horse, when I put pads under his front feet, he would do the startle and then look at the pad like it might bite him. Um, and over the four days, you could see him go from that startle to, okay, looking at the pads. And then when I did the back feet, he was like, wow, this is cool. I really like the back feet. Um, but you, and by the fourth day, he dropped his head and neck and nuzzled the ground and you could see the processing. And I've always thought of it like toggling the parasympathetic switch, like teaching them how to throw the switch. And, and in a sense, that's true. It's just a slightly different switch than what I thought I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that learning how to throw the switch to get to it feels safe. That's yes. So Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go out of here so I can just see you. Yep, yep. I just have my, my info on here. I do have some resources, but I, I think I won't put those on right now. We can do those another time. Sure. Just, and we just, can um, we can post them online when I put up. Actually, what I'll do is I'll run through the slides. I'll just put them here, and if people want to see them, there's three slides. Perfect. So, and then people can just look at them on the recording. There's one. So these are people that inform the work that I talked about here. Um, really interesting, really great stuff. So there's three sets of pages of resources for people that want them. And now yeah. I'm and that's, oh, yeah. um, I love the bathroom color, <laughs> but it's so, um, are you muted? I can't hear you. No, I'm, I'm here. Oh, you. oh, you just went like that without a sound. I get it. Um, so this is the thing that I've, I've seen is that, um, some horses you put them on the pad and they instantly, I had one horse, he was a, had been a school horse in Appaloosa, very, very stiff, very chompy on the bit, stuck him on a pad in two minutes less dropped his neck, stopped chomping on the bit, didn't chomp on the bit the rest of the clinic, whereas the stallion was so clearly in a different state starting out in this, you know, state of high anxiety, where the other horse was probably more shut down being a school horse. And so here's these two horses coming from the opposite directions and taking a different time to get there and a, and a different process in the use of the pads, but both of them getting to a place where the stallion could do a flat foot walk and totally blew the woman's mind. Mm -hmm. 
because, yeah. you know, and then she started telling me about his ulcers and the injuries he's had when he was young and how he was like that when he came out of the body, you know, when he was born and because she'd had him from uh, just a few months old. And so it sounds like he never really learned how to throw that. He was still stuck in the more primitive ventral. Is that right? The ventral. No, dorsal. The dorsal one, yeah. 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 The, the, so the dorsal one's down in the guts. I mean, the gut feelings down in the lower gut for us. The abdominal and the ventral tends to be more in the complex that's around here and in the facial nerves, sort of upper, upper area, heart area, um, heart cavity area, and, and up for, for humans, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of where it's located more, and along with the facial expression. But yeah, and I think it really depends on life experience and, and how many opportunities you've had to, to learn how to switch from one to the other. Right, and that the one really is a learned behavior, and so that that just sparks more uh, curiosity and questions. Um, this has been super fascinating. Um, we're, I think we need to follow up with this and do another one and kind of where does it go from here and how does yeah. that play out a little bit more because this was kind of like the, the sort of what it is. Yeah. And um, you and I are going to be up in Canada this coming week and we're going to play with sure foot pads and do some experiments on breathing. I cannot wait. Um, I've been like panting, practicing frantically to find, figure out what I need up there. Um, but I'm really looking forward to it. And I think that um, the more information people get about this and start to, I think and one of the things that we should talk about at some point is giving examples of what horses look like when they're in different states. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. So recognize that. And so I think that's going to be a really important piece to this so that helping people along so they can go, okay, my horse is doing this and this, or I see this and this. And so he, he's most likely in this state and yeah. then being able to observe because that's the thing I find just most people need help with is how to observe what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't like it's something where you don't have to be perfect in those things, but you can start to notice and go, Oh, okay. Maybe that's something going on. I can think about it that way. Right. And, and then see if I can shift something and does that change for the horse. Right. So it's becoming detectives. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I think what we're going to do is, is uh, end here. We'll post this up on Facebook. It'll be up on my YouTube channel and um, I'll list your contact information. Great. And We'll make a plan to do another one. Sounds good. Super. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I was delighted. Thanks very much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.